This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 1046, recorded on September 21, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from New York, Daniel Griffin. Hello, everyone. Daniel, I went to my doc today, and we got to talking about COVID, and he said, yeah, Rebound is a thing, but it's really rare. <laughs> I can't escape it. Oh my gosh! Okay, K- kill me now. Um, all right, we'll we'll, <laughs> we'll talk about that. But uh, let's start off with a quotation. I actually uh, was listening to one of the other uh, twibs, and uh, Vincent, you mentioned the book Fever: The Hunt for a New Killer Virus. Also, one of my favorites. Oh, look at that! This is um, a 1970 copy that I have had for years. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, great I was book. given a copy by one of the uh, one of the characters in the yeah. book. Uh, yeah, so you have a you you gave me a picture of the autograph inside it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so here we go. In these times, the predictability of viruses creates a situation which is as delicate as a hand grenade with the pin pulled. The only answer is constant vigilance. Um, people seem to have forgotten that. I think. I think the current uh, updated version is the 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 only answer is to put our head in the sand. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> so, all right. Well, let's take our head out of the sand for a moment. We'll start with flu RSV. Actually, really, this is a uh, wastewater. So, flu and RSV all in one with the MMWR wastewater surveillance data as a complement to emergency department visit data for tracking incidents of influenza A, that's the epidemic, and respiratory syncytial virus, Wisconsin, August 2022 through March 2023. Um, And really what we're seeing here is um, it's all in the figures. And so um, people should take a little time. But basically, there's a um, a positive correlation between the two surveillance systems. Um, the waste water surveillance basically shows that numbers start to go up and we actually get a little bit of a warning. So uh, wastewater goes up for flu and then we start to see ED visits for flu. The wastewater starts to go up for RSV and then we see the ED visits go up for RSV. So it's, it's really a nice early warning um, system. And I was, I was talking to our urgent care doctors this week about how it would be really nice, right? If, you know, we check our weather, we check our news, um, you know, for our employment, it might be nice to get the alert, you know, by the way, wastewater surveillance has, you know, risen above such and such a threshold, you know, get prepared for the next few weeks when we'll see flu or RSV. So are we going to get those reports or are they going to just keep them? <laughs> you know, y- you actually have to go on. You've got to do the labor. You know, someone needs to make an app. And it yeah. should be on the phone of all, yeah. You know, well, I'm going to say all providers, right? Urgent care, primary care, infectious disease. And then you sort of, you know, you, you instead of just checking the weather and tracking the hurricanes out in the Pacific or the Atlantic, oh. I guess. Oh, we should be on all TWIV podcasters so we can say with the weather, here's what's going on in the sewage, right? Yeah, you guys, stop talking about the weather. Start talking about this wastewater. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm all for it. Somebody write the app. All it has to do is pull the data. Yeah, you'll be like, it is now 22 degrees. RSV levels have passed the the 200. You know, yeah. So. We have All to right. give it. A, we have to give it a good name, right? A really cool name. Yeah, maybe uh, maybe people can write in. Maybe there's some people out there that want to create a, a an app with the wastewater viral concentrations. Um, and then, you know, you could actually see it starting to graph up and you can look, oh, look, you know, human metanuma virus. But um, and somehow it's got to be linked to the data. All right. Well, last week we talked a bit about flu, RSV and updated uh, COVID vaccines and the messaging around the new wild to mild campaign. Um, now, how are we going to communicate? Well, apparently this is uh, Vincent's favorite thing. Um, we're going to have a chat bot. <laughs> reach out to people and encourage them to get vaccinated. So the article chatbot delivered online intervention to promote seasonal influenza vaccination during the COVID-19 pandemic, a randomized clinical trial published in JAMA Network Open. 
Um, so these are the results of a non-blinded parallel group randomized clinical trial conducted between December 1st, 2021 and July 31, 2022 in Hong Kong, China. Um, eligible participants were 65 years or older, had Cantonese and or Mandarin speaking skills. So this is a Mandarin Cantonese speaking chatbot. Were community dwelling, had Hong Kong residency, were smartphone users, had not yet received their seasonal influenza vaccine, their CIV, for the 2021 through 2022 influenza season. Yeah, Daniel, uh, you know, we can't use SIV for that abbreviation. <laughs> you know, isn't that a problem? I saw that. I was like, oh my gosh. See, you know, <laughs> you have to be like, careful with these uh, three-letter acronyms, right? I've got, ha have you gotten your SIV yet? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, participants were recruited through random telephone calls, and those who completed the baseline telephone survey were randomized to um, receive the intervention, you know, get called by the chat bot or to be in the control group. Um, and in the intervention group, a simplified rule-based chat bot first assessed the participants' um, SOC. Let, let's see what the SOC stands for. What was the SOC? Hmm. I'm not even seeing what the SOC. That's a problem with all these three-letter acronyms. Um, basically, they're going to have a chat bot is going to tailor online health promotion messages, um, and they're going to do this every two weeks for four sessions. And what did they find? Well, they they recruited uh, about 400, so 396 participants. Um, about 70 years, right? So you got to be over 65. 63% were, were females. Um, they randomized them sort of one-to-one, -one, 198 in the intervention, 198 in the controlled. Um, and they showed that the seasonal influenza vaccine uptake rate was higher in those that got called by the chat pot. So 50% versus 35%. States of change. <laughs> okay. That's what SOC is. So the chatbot is uh, improving the the rate of change. All right. So uh, after we get our chatbots to encourage everyone to get their uh, their flu vaccine, maybe also chatbots tell people to get their COVID vaccine. What is going on with COVID? Um, you know, and I, I think you know, just like I talked about, we need an app where people can know what's what's about to come from the wastewater data. Um, you know, you can actually go on. I'm going to leave a link. You can go on covid.cdc.gov. You can look at the COVID tracker. You can look at what's going on with new admissions per week. Um, and you can actually see that we are still in the midst of a steep rise. We have uh, more weekly COVID-19 hospitalization admissions um, since we had in early March of 2023. Um, and also, if you look at this data, you start to get a sense of when we see these rises, right? So we see sort of an early, we see a plateau, and then it's really are January when we tend to historically see these peaks. Um, and actually, the biggest peak was 2021 as far as hospital admissions, interesting enough. All right. Well, I wanted to start this, this article with sort of a reminder of the early days. It takes a while sometimes to get the data, but the article, Temporal Association of Disparities in California COVID-19 Mortality by Industry, a population-based retrospective cohort study published in Annals of Epidemiology. Now, here the investigators used a population-based retrospective cohort study approach. They identified COVID-19 deaths that occurred between January 2020 and May 2022 among the California working population age 18 through 64 using death certificates. They used the current population survey to drive estimates for working age Californians at risk of COVID-19 mortality. Um, so a couple things you're sort of seeing. We're not looking at everyone. We're looking at this 18 through 64. Um, and what they're really trying to look at is what was the mortality by industry? Um, and they're going to look at the different different waves of the pandemic. But in all the waves of the pandemic, um, you can see that healthcare is um, one of the highest risk industries. 
Um, and here we're seeing a, an increase um, risk 2.49. Um, other service industries also up there 2.89. Manufacturing uh, about twice the risk. Transportation also elevated 2.64. Retail a little bit less than two, so 1.9. Um, and really much, much higher than professional scientific technical industry um, where we're seeing the lowest rates. Uh, and not only will I leave a link to this for people to take a look at this, but I also want to leave a link to um, a project called Lost on the Front Line. Um, and this is uh, really recording the almost 4,000 U.S. healthcare workers that died in the first year of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and it just has a, has a photo, has a little bit about them, just sort of turning those statistics into uh, real people. Just, just I think a lot of us have forgotten how bad it was in those early days as people say things like, oh, it's just the flu, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think we really need to realize just how incredibly powerful these um these vaccines are in transforming um, how effective these medications are in transforming it from those early days. Can you imagine if we had had Paxlovid from the start, how much different it would have been? You know, not only would it be different, but I think it would be different now because um, we'll talk about mm. a little bit later. But when you were saying, OK, 20 percent of my patients are going to end up in the hospital and you could drop that from 20 to two right in front of you, um, I think it would have helped people. Because now we're talking about, you know, maybe taking, you know, six percent and dropping that down to two or three. It's not quite um, as, as sort of real time feedback. Um, it would have been great in the early days to have that reinforced. All right. Ventilation transmission. Now, this is exciting stuff, Vince, and I hope you're as excited as I am. Uh, people are excited. <laughs> well, both. when you say that, then I I have suspicions. So but go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for those following this, um, a CDC advisory committee has been updating its 2007 standards for infection control in hospitals this year. Um, now, couple things to comment. So 2007, since the CDC has updated its standards for infection control in hospitals, that's one kind of comment. Boy, that's been a long time. Um, the other is this is just hospitals. Um, they released a uh, basically a PowerPoint on what they've been sort of thinking about discussing. Uh, the final form probably won't be out until November. Um, but a big change that I've talked about over time is there used to be this binary that was right in the middle of respiratory transmission. They've now changed that binary to being between air and touch. And so as they consider transmission via air, they make a few comments. So they point out, historically, the infection prevention community has categorized transmission of respiratory pathogens as droplet or airborne. We've talked about how this goes back to uh, about 100 years ago. And as they comment in their slide deck, while these epidemiological terms reflect observed patterns of short versus long distance transmission, respectively, the terms do not explicitly describe a continuum of respiratory pathogen transmission through in the air. Um, they go on to say all pathogens that spread via the air preferentially transmit over short distances due to greater concentration of infection infectious particles in the air near an infectious person. However, each pathogen has a signature pattern, observed transmission that extends variably across short to long distances and over time, reflecting unique characteristics of pathogen durability while suspended in the air and the required dose for causing an infection in a susceptible host. And then they're going to suggest new air trans mission-based precaution categories. Um, and I'm going to go through these because in a sense, we've talked about the fact that some people are already sort of moving in this direction. So um, I, I'm actually, I actually am excited about this update. I know a lot of people, it's very controversial. I'll discuss why. Um, but one of the things I really like as we get into this is they're moving away from droplet and airborne, <clears throat> things that have meaning outside of the uh, transmission um, directives, right? People say, how can it be, not be airborne if it's transmitted through the air? So let's use terminology. So these are the new draft transmission-based precautions to prevent transmission by air. So, and I'm going to start with the highest level, extended air precautions. This is where it's recommended um, that an N95 
respirator be used. Um, they're also recommending that the person be in an airborne infection isolation room. So that's the negative pressure room. Um, and they give example pathogens, tuberculosis, measles, varicella. And then they have what I think we refer to at Columbia as enhanced droplet, what they're now calling novel air precautions, where you wear an N95 respirator. You don't have to have the person in a negative pressure room. You just keep the door closed um, and then routine air precautions um, where you might wear a medical or surgical mask. You don't have to have them in a negative pressure room. Eye protection is recommended for the novel air precautions, possibly for extended air precautions. For the novel air precautions, that would be MERS, SARS-CoV-2, SARS-CoV-1, pandemic phase respiratory viruses. Um, now, routine air precautions just for coronavirus seasonal influenza. I don't like this novel in the middle of the two, right? I get extended, <laughs> I get routine, but novel? Yeah, novel is sort of odd, right? It's, novel it's air precautions, like it's how long right. will it be novel? Should it be, yeah. No, it needs another word to put it in the middle there. I mean, I know what they're trying to do, but. You yeah, know, and it, I would, a, I, it does need a better. I would yeah. like some words that give you a hint of mechanism, right? But. Yeah, what are you, you going to suggest? Enhanced well, yeah. air precautions? I like enhanced. For routine, the middle one? Enhanced, extended. Right, enhanced would work if you want to stay with this, yeah. Yeah. Um, and now it, what a lot of people are concerned about, right? And there's actually, there was actually a letter to, um, I say Manny Cohen in my notes, but it's actually Mandy Cohen, Dr. Mandy Cohen. CDC, HIC, PACS, plan to weaken guidance for healthcare respiratory protection and infection control. And I'll leave a link into it. Um, you know, they put out this PowerPoint. They're asking for feedback and input. Um, some of the things people didn't like is um, some of the articles that were um, referenced in the, in the deck here um, seem to suggest that maybe the medical surgical face masks are, you know, pretty good and almost as good as N95s. That's not what I'm seeing in the uh, updated draft of the transmission-based precautions. They also talk about how those um, N95s can, you know, tire you out. They can give you acne or, or I think it's called maskne and stuff like that. Um, but I do like the fact that this old binary in the middle of respiratory, which goes back to over a hundred years, is finally being addressed, finally being updated. People are also saying, hey, by the way, if you're going to do this, you should get people who are expert in these different areas, um, you know, moving away from this five micron thing that people have talked about for over a hundred years. All right. So I actually like this, Vincent. I'm, I'm optimistic that in November, we're going to have an updated, improved, um, bit of guidance. Cause right now, you know, some of the hospitals, they, they put airborne, they put the big red signs up and then the door's sitting there like half open and the person's sitting in a regular room next to a neighbor. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, yeah. yeah let's, let's be honest with what we're actually doing. All right. COVID active vaccination. Um, I was talking with our Optum pediatricians this week and reviewing what is new with, with RSV, but also what's new with COVID vaccine guidance. Um, and I'll leave a link in here to, uh, a updated CDC page, September 15th. Um, in a sense, things have gotten a little bit easier for just about everyone but the pediatricians. Um, and the CDC now recommends, we've talked about different levels of recommendation, um, updated COVID-19 vaccines for really everyone six months and up. Uh, really aged five years and up, you you get one is the recommendation. Uh, we've talked about how the the level of recommendations increase for folks who are higher risk coming from other groups. Um, but still for those kids six months to four years of age, um, you're going to be getting an updated vaccine. With Pfizer, it's going to be three doses on a schedule. With Moderna, it's going to be two doses on a schedule. And one of the questions that came up last time is one of the comments put forth by Dr. Mandy Cohen. The more people who get the shots, the bigger difference it can make in how many Americans are sick and the ability of our healthcare system to handle influxes of patients. So this is this whole question of, am I doing something for other people when I get a vaccine? The more people that get vaccinated, does that really affect um, what's going on around us? So, so how do we figure that out? Well, there's a couple, couple, couple ideas of how we might try to do some science here. Um, so we can do some modeling. Um, so I, I'm going to reference the article 
modeling the impact of a high uptake bivalent booster scenario on the COVID-19 burden and healthcare costs in New York City, published in the Lancet Regional Health. Um, but here's the challenge. As we read in the supplementary materials, we performed a literature review to derive the estimates of vaccine effectiveness following each dose of vaccine against infection, symptomatic disease, and severe disease for all variants in this model. So this is tough because do we really know what the effectiveness of the new updated vaccine is against infection, symptomatic, and severe disease for all variants above prior infection, prior vaccination in many cases or both. So searching around, I found this article. Can high COVID-19 vaccination rates in adults help protect unvaccinated children? Evidence from a unique mass vaccination campaign, Schwartz, Austria, March 2021, published in Eurosurveillance. So here they use this sort of unique opportunity that was presented after the government of Austria supplied 100,000 extra doses of the Comirnaty vaccine to rapidly mass vaccinate the entire adult population um, over the age of 16 of Schwartz. So after the first campaign weekend in March 2021, around 70% of the adult population of Schwartz had received their first dose. In contrast, the rest of the country had a very low vaccination coverage, a first dose of only around 10% at that time. Now of note, they're only vaccinating those over the age of 16 as the vaccines were not approved for younger ages until 28 May, 2021. Um, so this local mass vaccination campaign created a situation in which we have really high coverage of the adults, and then we have an unvaccinated 16 and under, and then we can compare that uh, to uh, surrounding folks. And they're going to observe them for three months. So they're going to observe them until the end of May when the kids can actually get access. So they observed a reduction in daily COVID cases of 57.4%. Okay, that's fine. We got all these folks getting vaccinated but what about potentially a benefit for the kids? So for the children below 16, they saw, we'll call it a bystander, um, observed reduction in daily COVID cases of 42.8%. Well, that's convincing as long as there are no issues with this, this, uh, this, this way of studying it, which is an interesting way, right? Yeah. Uh, as long as those kids are not vaccinated, right? They only vaccinated over the age of 16. As long as that's yep. correct, who knows? <laughs> Maybe <laughs> who knows? some of those kids snuck in and got vaccinated. I just oh don't. my gosh, it, it's it's Austria, right? Remember, this is this is like that. <laughs> you know, this is where if you show up, you've been pickpocketed and show up to uh, get your wallet, and it's three minutes past seven, they won't hand it to you until the next day. But uh, okay. No, I mean, there are some challenges. I mean, I like this because this is actually, you know, sort of bystander effect. Yeah. But remember, it's only three months, right? But that's what they're sort of yeah. arguing with yeah. the boosters. You know, three to four months, we get everyone so, vaccinated. Maybe there'll be a bystander effect. So here's the thing, folks. It's not because it's sterilizing immunity in the adults. It's reducing the amount of shedding. And that reduces the transmission. So stop saying sterilizing, okay? <laughs> I don't want to be sterilized. Do you want to be sterilized? No, no, no I don't. But uh, it's it's not sterilizing. It's all you need is a reduction in shedding. Don't you agree, uh, Daniel, with that, that? that? That's the goal. That's the goal. Yeah. And the it's, goal it's is, transient. Yeah. It's because it, antibodies don't last at high levels forever. So it's transient. It's the same thing we're trying to do with this new vaccine this fall is give you a couple of months of reduced shedding, right? Yep. Yeah. And hopefully, uh, hopefully this will pan out. Hopefully there'll be a personal, you know, benefit and maybe there'll be a societal benefit as well. So but the question is, did CDC had know this data when she made that statement? <laughs> I'm sure Dr. Cohen knew this data, but uh, <laughs> all right. All right. So let's move to the COVID early viral phase. Um, and I, I'm going to start with a little bit of an anecdote. Um, hopefully people will find this educational, uh, really enter ed edutaining, I think is what we like to say. So I get a call on uh, Sunday morning from, from a primary care doc about a patient in their 90s, tested positive. They want to know, you know, should they go ahead with the Paxlovid? They've heard about this rebound. Um, and so we have a little bit of a conversation. I reach out to the, the gentleman in, in the 90s. Um, First thing is this gentleman did an at-home COVID test. 
and it was reportedly positive. So I asked about it. Oh, you know, I had uh, my housekeeper read it. They told me it was positive. There was a line. I was like, was there one line? Was there two lines? I don't know. <laughs> All right. Let's start by repeating that test. We repeat the test. There was one line. Yes, the control line, not the positive test line. So that's one of the first things. Like, let's let's sort of judge. Let's talk to our patients. If you need to have them send us a photo, if you need to jump on a FaceTime or a telehealth, whatever it is, um, if someone is using those home tests, you may even want to observe them. Watch that they get a good sample. Watch that they do the test properly because um, we're making a big decision. We're about to maybe spend eight or $900 on a medication. Um, we're potentially going to be adjusting, maybe stopping or adjusting other medicines to make that happen. So that's one of the first things is, is make sure you spend the time to, uh, to get the diagnosis correct. Um, the next thing is there is a challenge with adjusting the medication. So this provider I'm talking to, um, a bit hesitant to uh, to use the Paxlova because they were concerned. They they told me a story. They had a patient on diltiazem, high dose. Um, they stopped the diltiazem, and that person then ended up having issues. And I asked them, you know, so you just stopped the diltiazem? Did you did you look this up? How did you do this? So this is really a plug for something I do all the time. Take the time. Go onto your computer, use the Liverpool COVID-19 drug interaction checker, go through the medicines. Let's say diltiazem comes up as a possible drug interaction. And they will, they'll go ahead and there's a whole little blurb. They'll tell you that diltiazem is metabolized by the CYP3A4, the CYP2D6, that there's um, probably going to be an interaction. They'll recommend not stopping the diltiazem, but a dose reduction of 50%. Really, it's all out there to help you manage these drug-drug interactions. Um, and the next thing I want to just going to have to keep saying this a million times, there is no such thing as Paxlovid rebound. 20% um, of high-risk patients will feel better and then they will feel worse during that second week. That is whether you treat them or not. The big difference during that second week is whether or not they end up in a hospital. So let's talk about another article. The article, Nermitrelvir, Ritonavir Use and Hospitalization or Death in a Previously Uninfected, Non-Hospitalized, High-Risk Population with COVID-19 Matched Cohort Study, published in JID. So here are the results of a matched cohort design um, where they're going to look at individuals prescribed Paxlovid within three days of a COVID diagnosis um, compared with untreated controls, oh my gosh, among 7,615 individuals prescribed Paxlovid and 62,000 controls, these are people who did not get treated, um, the risk of hospitalization and death was, oh my gosh, lower among the folks that got Paxlovid versus untreated treated controls. The difference was significant for those over 60 as well as those less than 60. Interesting for asymptomatic and symptomatic persons. They're actually seeing benefit. Asymptomatic folks are actually ending up getting hospitalized. Significant benefit was observed among unvaccinated and vaccinated individuals, those with and those without a booster. But I want to put this in context, right? We were talking early on, you know, what, what if Paxlovid had been here in the early days, right? In the early days, about 20% of folks ended up in the hospital. High-risk people, it was even higher, right? So a high-risk person maybe with someone with a 40% risk of ending up in the hospital. Um, these are uninfected, but many of these folks are now vaccinated. Um, in the control group with 62,000, we saw 3,468 hospitalizations, or death, combined endpoint, or about 6% progressing to this endpoint. In the treated group, this drops to 243, only about 3%. So number one, as we've been saying, we do recommend Paxlovid. Number two, Remdesivir. Three, Molnupiravir. Four, convalescent plasma for a certain select group, and avoid doing those harmful things. As we've discussed, early steroids can increase your risk of progression, basically turning off the immune system when you need it most. Second week, we've been talking about this forever, the cytokine storm. What you can do is turn this from wild into mild with Paxlovid, Malnupiravir, Remdesivir. If they end up here, we're looking at treating those patients with steroids, anticoagulation, pulmonary support, maybe remdesivir, and immune modulation. 
And I'm going to finish this off with, uh, with, well, an article that another group published. Hopefully our group will publish our article soon. But the article, Vaccination After Developing Long COVID Impact on Clinical Presentation, Viral Persistence, and Immune Responses, recently published in the National Journal of Infectious Diseases. Now, there's growing evidence of a preventative and therapeutic benefit for vaccination in terms of long COVID, but what about mechanism? They're going to try to get at that a little. So these are the results of a prospective observational cohort study that evaluated the number of um, PCC, so that's post-COVID condition symptoms, um, affected organ systems and psychological well-being scores before and after patients with post-COVID conditions received COVID-19 vaccination. So they simultaneously evaluated biomarkers of systemic inflammation, levels of plasma cytokines and chemokines. They measured blood, um, plasma, and intracellular level of SARS-CoV-2 antigens, which is interesting, and immunoreactivity to SARS-CoV-2 antigens in blood. Um, so we'll start off with the numbers. These are not huge numbers. And actually, um, I'll tell you from our study, it's hard to recruit for these studies. Of the 83 participants included in this study, 44 had not yet received a COVID-19 vaccine at the inclusion visit, is unvaccinated, while the remaining 39 had already received one or two doses. Of the 44 unvaccinated participants, 39 were also evaluated um, after one, that was 23, or two, that was 16 vaccine doses. They also performed a cross-sectional analysis comparing all unvaccinated participants with those having received um, one or two vaccine doses. So not exactly the study design I was hoping for, right? Ideally, what I want is all unvaccinated people with PASC or post-COVID conditions, and then a one-to-one, -one, right? You know, half of them get the vaccine, half of them get that saline shot, and then we go measuring stuff at different time points. So some limitations here in design, just to point that out. Um, now, what they do find within the limitations outlined here is that COVID-19 vaccination was associated with a decreased number of post-COVID condition symptoms. So pre-vaccination, 6.56, uh, post-vaccination, 3.92, affected organ systems, we see 3.19 dropping down to 1.89, and we see increases in the World Health Organization 5 well-being index scores, pre-vaccination 42.7, going up to 56. Um, now, patients with post-COVID conditions, that's where it sort of gets into the molecular, they also had significantly decreased levels of several pro-inflammatory plasma cytokines, chemokines, um, including soluble CD40L, GRO-alpha, macrophage inflammatory protein, so MIP1-alpha, interleukin-12, um, P40, um, GSF, MCSF, IL-1 beta, and stem cell factor. Now, this was interesting. They report that SARS-CoV-2 S1 antigen persisted in the blood of PCC participants, mostly in non-classical monocytes, regardless of participants receiving vaccination. Um, this last one's kind of interesting. So the investigators say, how did they do this? So they tell us that they measured concentrations of soluble SARS-CoV-2 spike and nucleocapsid proteins um, using a, a special kit. Um, they also actually did intracellular staining. So th this is interesting that, all right, so there's a reduction in long PCC symptoms, right, with vaccination. I'm curious yeah, so there's a, yeah. as to whether subsequent doses would further reduce it. Because the other day, Paul Offit said, after three boosters, three doses of vaccine, the effect on long COVID is is much diminished. So uh, I, that needs to be yeah. redone with currently circulating variants and the new vaccines, right? Yeah, I think that's, uh, so I'm going to agree with Paul based upon some of the research I've seen here, right? So we saw, and I'm just going to sort of give numbers, right? Like a 40%, um, mm -hmm. you know, people improved with the first shot, we right. pick up another 20% with the second shot, we pick up less than 5% with the third shot. And then we really see 1% or less yeah. after that. So right. you sort of, yeah, really diminishing returns. Big bang with the first, okay with the second. Yeah. So do we do we keep throwing, you know, people with long COVID? We go, oh, let's throw the updated vaccine. Maybe now with new variants, we need to repeat those interventions. Yeah. So. Yeah. 
All right. And I will close out here with no one is safe until everyone is safe. Thank you, everyone who's been going to ParasitesWithoutBorders.com and clicking donate. Uh, we're trying to get up. We want to get up to $10,000. If we can raise $10,000 in August, September, and October, we're going to double that and give a potential maximum donation of $20,000 to floating doctors down there in Panama. Uh, one of the doctors from there is up visiting at the moment. They're struggling. Uh, so everything you can do. Um, thank you. It's time for your questions for Daniel. You can send yours to daniel at microbe.tv. Dave writes, thanks so much for all your advice on TWIV. I have numerous friends who are trying to get advanced Paxlovid prescriptions filled so they can take it early as advised in case they test positive while traveling. They're all elderly and definitely fall into high risk categories. Most are getting denied or told useless advice like Call me if you test positive and hungry. Could you possibly update your COVID advice document with a few lines on Paxlovid travel guidance? It would be useful to have an authority to point to since the CDC has been woefully silent on the issue. Most docs seem barely aware that the EUA restrictions are no longer in effect. Unfortunately, among the cruise ship set, this will probably lead to some preventable deaths. Yeah, Dave, thanks for, for writing in. It, it's interesting. We've talked about this several times and even the fact that we're, we're, not, we're not even using this off label. We're just, you know, prescribing it in advance. Um, yeah. You know, here, you know, you're traveling. Here's, you know, here's your treatment. Only take it if you test positive. And I do. Yeah. Oh, if you test positive and you're in Hungary, uh, how are you supposed to get your... Uh, your Paxlovid if you're out on a cruise ship. And these are some high risk individuals who, you know, we just talked about that recent study is 6%, you know, so, so let's say, you know, um, try to do the math in my head, one in 15, you're going to, you know, high risk person, you could calculate, oh, you got a one in 15 chance of progressing to hospitalization. We can reduce that, you know, 90%. Um, you know, one of the emails I recently got from a listener in, um, Maine is that a lot of the Paxlovid prescriptions that are still sitting there on shelves are still packaged in the EUA boxes. Yeah, and right. the pharmacists feel like, oh, but if it's packaged in the EUA box, I have to follow the EUA. I'm not sure where that came from. It is a fully licensed, you know, you can use it and you're not even using an off label here. And if you look at the EUA, the EUA does not say that you need to have a confirmed positive test. The EUA was updated. So, you know, you're basically, we are prescribing Paxlovid for the treatment of acute COVID. We just might be sending the prescript in, the script in before the test comes positive, before the, before the, um, indication um, arises. Um, and also, actually, we do have a listener, and I think we are going to be updating those COVID treatment summaries. So um, yeah, if our listener wants to help us, there are going to be nice graphics and stuff. So we'll get those updated. <laughs> Jen writes, my husband's seven-year-old and I have been very COVID cautious, but we're about to have a lot of potential exposure on an early October trip to Japan with 45 members of our extended family, mainly because there will be no way to avoid indoor dining for all or most meals. We're trying to decide how to time our vaccines with this trip. And I'm separately agonizing over whether to go at all since I'll be 30 weeks pregnant at the time. Here are my questions. One, and we'll take these one at a time. As you've discussed, it's a little early to get COVID and flu shots. Ordinarily, we wouldn't rush out for boosters given our trust in our primary vaccine series. But our main goal is to prevent me, the pregnant person, from contracting COVID from this trip. So we are hoping to capitalize on the early protection from infection that a booster might offer. Would you recommend that we get these shots now in advance of our early October trip, since we will have way more exposure than we want, or save the protection for later in the season? It I would be 28 to 29 weeks at the time of a pre-trip booster. Okay. Yeah. So this, this is a good question, right? Cause Vincent, I've been thinking about this lately. Like normally I do my, my flu shot in early November, end of October. Cause I'm sort of thinking, you know, Thanksgiving, um, end of December holidays, but now you and I are going to be attending a bunch of conferences first up in Boston, then out in Chicago. Um, and I'm starting to think uh, maybe, maybe if I'm going to get myself boosted for the, the flu protection, uh, maybe if I'm going to get this new vaccine, maybe I want to time it two weeks before that. That. Um, the challenge, right? And you're, you're understanding the science here. We're mm -hmm. only thinking a three to four month boost above that enduring protection from the, the vaccine. So, I mean, I think what you're starting to bring up is reasonable. We think you really get up about, about 
two weeks after that shot. But, you know, really it, it ramps up. That's our peak. And then it kind of goes down, you know, maybe 15, 20 percent per month after that. All right. So she says next updated vaccines have been slow to arrive in Seattle. We may not be able to get one until a week before the trip. Is it worth it or should we wait till we get back? I mean, a week before the trip, I mean, as I sort of, it'll be ramping up. I think that's reasonable. Um, yeah. Okay. So here comes Paxlovid. Since I'm <laughs> pregnant, I hope to get a Paxlovid prescription in advance of our trip, although I'm having a hard time finding a provider who recommends Paxlovid during pregnancy at all, much, much less as an advanced prescription. But I'm also considering not going on the trip because of possible risks to the baby. My midwives have said they're seeing placenta damage when parents contract COVID, but they don't have info on whether vaccination or Paxlovid mitigates that risk. Does research exist on the impact of Paxlovid or a primary vaccine series on the outcomes for a baby if a parent contracts COVID? So uh, you, you're you're listening to a provider who recommends Paxlovid uh, during pregnancy. Um, I should mention that the uh, professional society, the OBGYN professional society, recommends Paxlovid during pregnancy. Um, the CDC, we we all recommend, um, you know, those of those of us keeping up on the science and literature, um, recommend Paxlovid during pregnancy. It is a high risk state. Paxlovid has the ability to reduce your chance of severe disease. It also has the uh, advantage of protecting the unborn child, protecting you from an early uh, delivery, preterm delivery. Um, and so there there is uh, there is research on the primary vaccine series and Paxlovid protecting you and your baby. Um, so. All right, Rick writes, from your discussion on correctly using the SARS-CoV-2 rapid antigen test, I see this worst case scenario. Day zero, start to feel symptoms. Day one, first rapid test negative. Day three, second test negative. Day five, third test positive. Contact my Kaiser PCP, orders Paxlovid. Day six or seven, start Paxlovid. Am I too late to catch any active virus? Is starting Paxlovid this late in the replication cycle better than nothing? <laughs> yeah, you know, it's really interesting. If you look at the data, right, if you got to start it within the first three days, you know, 87% reduction, no, 89% reduction in progression in the first study. We started like day five, it's 87 start day six. I'm not thinking suddenly you fall off a cliff. So um, ideally, if you describe this worst case scenario on day five, when you test positive, uh, hopefully your Kaiser PCP gets that Paxlovid to you same day and you get going. Um, better than nothing, but ideally let's get a little bit uh, shorter. All right. Anonymous writes, I'm an old retired pediatrician. <laughs> <laughs> Followed your podcast for years. A question has come up in my family with respect to initial immunization of their two-year-old two daughter who, through misinformation, has been unimmunized against COVID. She's expecting a new sibling momentarily, and her mother, who has been immunized but not recently, and also has presumably acquired COVID as well. They wish to start her immunizations ASAP. Should she receive the complete series of the new vaccine or one of the older versions if she receives the new Moderna version just released, does she get two shots? She's in daycare. What advice to give her parents about exposure to the new infant? And what about exposure to her great-grandmother, who is 85 and on Xarelto? Okay, so great. Thank you for asking. I'm not sure why anonymous, but uh, <laughs> you're Dr. Anonymous. <laughs> so in a sense, I was saying it's been made quite a bit simpler. Um, and when I was talking to the pediatricians the other night, you know, this six month to, you know, five years, th that's really the high risk group, right? They don't come into this world necessarily with any pre existing immunity. Maybe mom has some degree of transfer of immunity. Um, but by the time you're six months to four, when you're two years old, um, you know, these, these are the kids that we saw a disproportionate number um, requiring medical attention for their acute COVID. So, for the Moderna, it's a two-shot series. Um, they would now get the updated vaccine. If it was Pfizer, it would be three shots. Again, they would get the um, updated vaccine. Um, that's what that that would be the advice in this. Uh, go ahead, get those immunizations ASAP, um, and the two shots of Moderna would be a fine um, 
approach. And as we talked about, it might not only uh, protect uh, the little one, um, but there may be some some bystander protection for that great grandmother who's 85. All right. Two more questions. We have a lot today because we're getting a lot of questions, Daniel. I guess it's COVID season. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Michael writes, I've had a few friends who have had COVID turn negative by lateral flow and then turn positive during rebound. I know rebound is not a thing after Paxlovid, but why would the assay turn positive again? Yeah. So, you know, this is something that we have seen for a really long time. So, you know, those, those antigen tests are actually picking up protein, right? You know, intracellular, right? You're not picking up from the mucus, you're actually picking it up. So during that inflammatory phase, you can often get significant shedding of the, the intranasal mm. um, cells. If you were to actually quantify this with PCR, you're not back up there in the millions, tens of millions that you saw early on, um, but you are picking up a little bit of positivity. Um, that should not be confused with viral rebound. That is not viral rebound. That is the cytokine storm second week. That's the early inflammatory phase. Um, you know, what I tell people is once you test positive and you know you had COVID, stop testing. All right. Last one is from Wendy. 27 weeks pregnant, healthy 30-year-old without any complications. As a virology PhD, yay. I am well aware of the importance of vaccination. Want maximum protection for my baby. Therefore, I want to get updated COVID vaccine, flu shot, newly approved RSV and Tdap vaccines. My OB only provides Tdap. She says I can get them from local pharmacy. I asked her about how should I schedule it. She only says she can give the Tdap vaccine on my 37 to 38 week latest. Others, I better have at least four weeks intervals apart. What would be your suggestion for the timeline? And I'm thinking getting COVID flu week 29, getting RSV week 33, Tdap week 37. Does that sound okay? <laughs> that does. That sounds great. And I, I should point out, right? So the RSV vaccine on week 33 is going to protect um, your child. I'm thinking about timing. It's actually perfect timing. It's going to protect them during this upcoming RSV season. All right. Second question. I don't have RSV vaccine ready in a nearby pharmacy for pregnant women. So they only have the one for 60 plus people. I believe the FDA already approved it for pregnant women based on your update, but has the CDC approved it? Do you know when RSV will be ready in the pharmacy for pregnant women. Do you know if there are any side effects related to pregnancy I should be aware of? Yeah, so it's a, it's the same actual, you know, so there's two approved RSV vaccines for the over 60. One of them is also approved and recommended for pregnant women. Um, the sort of a packaging challenge maybe, uh, unless they only are carrying one of the two and maybe they're carrying the one. Um, but side effects, um, no. Actually, this this was um, incredibly well tolerated, and you know, as mentioned, um, healthy kids end up in the hospital. So, you know, I think it's like two percent. One in fifty kids will end up in the hospital. That highest risk is right when your child's going to be born, um, and that's just hospitalization. Um, you know, forget about the three hundred children that die every winter. Forget about the thousands and thousands that end up needing to see the pediatrician, um, suffering through the misery of RSV. And third question, I always have a fever and whole body pain every time I take a COVID shot. However, I'm allergic to acetaminophen, so I can't take Tylenol. I used to take ibuprofen, but I'm pregnant, so it's not an option. With a baby in my body, I can't let my body temperature go high. What other pregnancy safe medicine you recommend me to prepare for the booster? My OB said I could probably take baby aspirin, but I'm not sure if I'm allergic since I have never taken it before. Yeah. So, you know, you always can use non-pharmacological ways of cooling yourself. I feel like we we underutilize this. We're quick to grab the pills, um, but, you know, a, a cool, moist cloth on the forehead, um, maybe your partner can, can help with that. Um, so, you know, it, it's fine to use um, different things to help with the, the temperature because that's the biggest thing, right? You know, you're pregnant. We really don't want that body temperature going up. We want to keep you cool and comfortable, drinking plenty of fluids, staying well hydrated. And I think, you know, taking advantage of non-pharmacological cooling approaches. That's TWIV Weekly Clinical Update with Dr. Daniel Griffin. Thank you, Daniel. Oh, thank you. And everyone be safe.